welcome back to AP Live Psychology. My name is Ms. Del Savio. I'm here to discuss with you uh, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and all that fun stuff you learned in your learning unit. So let's go ahead and get live. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. Okay, so what are we going to learn today? Well, we are actually going to start today uh, with getting some feedback and questions that you asked. I want to make sure I answer some of those. And while you're waiting for me and I'm answering those questions, you may want to go ahead and join nearpod.com. There's a feedback session in there and some fun bulletin board activity we'll be doing. But let's get back. A lot of you are asking for more multiple choice questions, more free response questions. So I tried to incorporate some more of those in today. I also had a question about unit two and the brain and the diagrams we had. Do you need to be able to recognize or label diagrams? Well, you might be asked to. You, it has been asked on other AP exams. So we wanna make sure that you are prepared for that. You've also asked for a list of important people. So we're gonna get right on that. It's not today for sure. But you also asked, what if you don't remember a term on the FRQ? Do your best and look at the term. Is it maybe something you can kind of decipher because it's an English language like availability heuristic? Oh, something's available to me. I know a heuristic's a shortcut. Uh, how am I gonna figure that out? So see if you can decipher it. And while you start to write that definition, maybe it will come to you. You'll be able to activate those, activate those neural networks. So we're going to move forward here and if you want to give feedback and you want to stump the teacher go ahead and scan this qr code and you can fill out that form with any three words from the curriculum that you think don't connect to each other but you can also give us feedback today we're going to review practice frq number three that the ever entertaining dr swope gave to you i will do a stump the teacher that i'll i pulled from what you asked for us to do we'll go go over unit four learning and then i will present practice frq number four for you that you'll have all weekend to do and then come back next week and review with dr swope so go ahead and scan that qr code get those phones out so you can give us some feedback and we promise we are listening Okay, practice, FRQ number three, Freddie Felderspar is quite lonely and looking for his friend Waldo all over the high school. The problem is that due to their school culture, lots of students dress similarly. How would the following terms either help or hinder Freddie's ability to find his friend? And those are the terms that Dr. Swope gave you to review. So let's take a look at some of the potential answers. And remember that just because I've written an answer a certain way, it doesn't mean you have to, okay? We're trying to give you the IDA, the identify, define, apply, apply way to answer these FRQs. So I'm gonna clarify this a bit more from what I did the last time. I, identify. You have to identify the term. And if there is no term, and instead it's a question being asked, then definitely un identify the question by giving it its own paragraph. Separate everything into paragraphs, okay? Define, define the term if you are given a term, even if you're not asked to. And like I said, on many research methods, FRQs, there might be a question like, uh, what is the most appropriate conclusion that can be drawn based on the figure above? Now you can't define anything there, right? But if you use a site term, when you refer to that figure above, do try to make sure you define that site term. For example, if it's positive correlation, make sure you explain what that is. Finally, and the most important thing, you want to be able to apply the term to the prompt, or if you're not applying a term, address the question asked without parroting the words in the prompt. So for example, if asked how de-individuation may increase risky behaviors, don't just define de-individuation and say it will increase a risky behavior. Give me an example. Tell me what de-individuation is. It's a phenomenon where people engage in sometimes violent acts when they believe they cannot be personally identified. Now, here's my example. If a person is in a large group and it is dark, they may be more likely to join in on acts of vandalism because they feel anonymous. So please make sure that you use those synonyms. Okay, sample response now for Freddie. So Freddie, how will he be able to find his friend, help or hinder, I should say, with absolute threshold? So we define absolute threshold, and then we tell you that if the auditorium is pitch black and Freddie has to rely on hearing Waldo's voice to locate him, it would be impossible if Waldo spoke so softly that the sound of his voice did not meet Freddie's absolute threshold for hearing. You could have done visual threshold, but I did auditory. Retinal disparity, that comparison of the two different images that each of our eyes gets, Freddie will be able to use that and perceive how far away Waldo is and find him by comparing these two different images. 
And when it comes to color constancy, we know that no matter what light a red shirt is in, it's still going to look red to us. So this will help Freddie find Waldo because he'll be looking for Waldo's red shirt, even if the light is in a dim room, okay? He'll still be able to find them, even if it's a slightly different hue than what he had imagined. Your sub cues, uh, we're talking here about principles of, of grouping the perceptual principles of grouping. And one of those is similarity. And that's one I chose. And if you're given something like gestalt cues or reinforcement schedules, you can pick which one you use, okay? So I chose to use similarity. And I said um, similarity when grouping objects together that share similar characteristics, that's something we do. So since everyone in the school we found out is wearing the same clothing, Freddie would not be able to distinguish Waldo from other students. And this would make it harder for him to locate him in the crowd. And finally, there's Weber's law. Weber's law is that law, that idea that if an intensity of a stimulus, the initial intensity is really light, you only need a small additional amount of that stimulus to notice the difference. But if it's a big stimulus and you get, you know, you need to be able to get a much bigger one in order to change, in order to notice that change. So I said that if he's looking for Waldo in a crowded library with a low level of noise, there's already a stimulus. It's a low level of noise that uh, he'd be able to detect the voice of his friend as long as Waldo was whispering just a little bit louder than others in the room. Low level, a little bit louder. The fovea, that's where we detect color. It has our cones. And I said, Freddie's friend Waldo has very bright red hair. And with the use of his phobias, which detect color, Freddie would be able to find Waldo by locating a red-haired person. And finally, perceptual sets. Those are ways that we expect to see stimuli. We, we have these schemas, right, these expectations. And if you expected, and if Freddie expected to find Waldo in a red shirt, and instead that day Waldo was wearing a green polka dot shirt, then it would be hard for Freddie and he might miss seeing him in a crowd. Right? So like I said, these are just examples. So they don't have to have exactly the same thing, but hopefully this gave you some idea of how you would respond to that FRQ. I'm moving on to stump the teacher and I'm going to operationalize the term stump for you because that's what we need to do. My operational definition of stump is that when I looked at these three words and I tried to connect them, it took me more than 30 seconds to come up with a scenario. Here are my two scenarios. The first one, I don't know who put this in. It was cognitive dissonance, observational learning, and aphasia. How did I connect them? Well, you observed that people found pleasure from eating fried food, so now you eat fried food. Observational learning. You know that eating fried food is not healthy, but you do it anyway, so you experience dissonance and resolve that dissonance by justifying that you're young, you'll eat healthier when you get older. But, you know, here it is 50 years later and you're still eating that fried food. And as a result of that, you've had a lot of strokes and those strokes have damaged your left frontal lobe. And now you're broke as aphasia, so you cannot direct the muscle movements to speak. Okay, that was number one. The second one I looked at, it says set point of the race effect and REM rebound. You are a chronic insomniac. You never get enough sleep and you gain a lot of weight. We know that happens. As a result, your set point rises to a higher level. Okay. And as a result of your insomnia, you go to see a doctor and they prescribe a sleep study and they hook you up to an EEG to measure your brain waves. And while waiting for the results, a woman who you think is your doctor walks into the room and you inquire about the findings. She looks at you, puzzled, and says, well, your doctor will join you in a minute. She and your doctor are both a different race than you are, and so you have a difficult time distinguishing between their facial features. That's the other race effect. And with REM rebound, your doctor comes in and pres prescribes you a benzodiazepine, which is a GABA agonist, right? It's going to lower your central nervous system activity so you can sleep. And for the next few nights, you spend a lot more time in REM sleep, which is REM rebound. So which of these stumped me? Let's see which one took me more than 30 seconds. And yes, it was that second one. So congratulations, whoever stumped me. That was hard. So what are we learning in unit, this unit? We are going to be looking at all the principles of operating classical conditioning. And we're going to go right down through this list and we're going to end up looking at behavioral therapies as they relate to treating autism spectrum disorder, phobias, and addictions. The skills you'll be doing is using what you learn to identify the components of classical conditioning and differentiate between scenarios that demonstrate punish and punishment and reinforcement and look at appropriate and determine the appropriate behavioral techniques to use to treat behaviors that are unwanted. 
we're starting right in classical conditioning. And in classical conditioning, we are talking about stimulus and response. So a stimulus is some external event and a response is some involuntary behavior. So what are we talking about other in terms of other vocabulary? We have conditioned and unconditioned. Now I want you to think conditioned is learned. Unconditioned is unlearned. This is innate. This is instinctual behavior. And sometimes you'll see them referred to as UCS, meaning unconditioned stimulus, or UCR, unconditioned response. Okay. We also have as vocabulary to know the word neutral stimulus. And a neutral stimulus is like, I don't know, something like I don't know, a pen, right? The pen would not normally provide any kind of natural response. I see a pen, I don't naturally sneeze or naturally get sick. Okay, that's a neutral stimulus. I want to talk about Pavlov's experiment very briefly just to set the context for today. In Pavlov's experiment, there was a stimulus and there was a response. In Pavlov's experiment, what was the unconditioned or the unlearned stimulus? What was the unconditioned or the unlearned response? Okay, so what was it here? Well, the unconditioned stimulus was food, which produces a natural response for a dog of salivation. Okay. So I'd like to just go into what are some examples of unconditioned or unlearned stimuli? Food poisoning, inhaling smoke, pollen or allergies, a pinch on your skin, a puff of air in your eye. Food poisoning would cause, okay, an unconditioned response, right? A, a, like nausea or inhaling smoke coughing to expel it from your lungs, pollen or allergy, sneezing to get it out of your, your tract, a uh, pinch, flinching, and it's painful, and a puff of air in the eye, eye blinking, okay? Those are responses or behaviors. And if you note, all of those responses and behaviors are from the autonomic nervous system, okay? These are behaviors that are likely non-conscious and not necessarily controllable. The neutral stimulus, going back to Pavlov's experiment, the neutral stimulus was what? Remember, this is the stimulus that would normally not produce salivation, which is an unconditioned or unlearned response. And yes, the answer is the bell. So before conditioning, uh, the meat would come out and the dog would salivate. You'd ring the bell, nothing would happen. It's a neutral stimulus. During conditioning, the bell was rung, the meat would come out, and the dog would salivate. And if you note here, after conditioning, I don't identify the bell as a neutral stimulus because it's not. Not anymore. Now it's a conditioned stimulus. It's learned. The dog has learned to associate okay, the sound of the bell with the presentation of meat. And he now salivates at the sound of the bell. Now, what if we were to take that bell and we use it to condition yet another stimulus? So that's called higher order or second order conditioning. So let's just say every time uh, Pavlov went to get the bell, he had to turn the light on, okay? So a light comes on, he gets the bell, he rings it, the dog salivates. Light comes on, gets the bell, rings it, the dog salivates. Eventually, after conditioning, the, the light will produce the salivatory response, okay? So that's called second order or higher order conditioning. So Watson and Rayner, they had an experiment they did, you probably remember it from Little Albert, where a neutral stimulus of a white rat was presented, a unconditioned stimulus of a very loud sound was presented, and then Little uh, Albert had an unconditioned response. It's called the moro or the startle reflex, where you, you yell, you shout, and you usually move your arms out to make yourself appear bigger if there's a threat. Now, little Albert learns to associate the white rat with that loud noise, and the white rat becomes a conditioned stimulus. Okay? And then little Albert crying when he sees the white rat is a conditioned response. But hey, guess what happens? The white rat, is, a white rabbit is presented, not a white rat. Little Albert still cries. Why? You remember why? Yeah, stimulus generalization. Little Albert's young. He has very like a schema for white furry things, and anything that's white and furry gets interpreted in that schema. Well, his schema of white furry things included loud sound, okay, is going to come next. So when he saw the white rabbit, he interpreted that new stimulus of a white rabbit using his an existing schema, and it's called stimulus generalization. 
let's practice a little bit with the idea of identifying the components of classical conditioning. And after eating chicken at a local diner, Harry comes down with the flu and was sick. And ever since then, Harry gets sick when he sees cooked chicken. What was the unconditioned or unlearned stimulus and the unlearned response? In times like this, sometimes I personally find it easier to look for the response, the behavior, right? That's almost easily identifiable. And I say, oh, the behavior is he came down with the flu and was sick. So he's sick. So what caused that? Well, that was the flu. And now I've got my first two. Okay. Now, the neutral stimulus, what was paired up with it? Well, it was eating chicken. So just the chicken itself, which eventually becomes a conditioned stimulus. And the conditioned response is feeling nauseous when seeing chicken. Now, Harry doesn't get sick when he sees a chicken running around in a yard. He doesn't get sick when he's served cooked turkey. Why not? Well, the thing is, he knows the difference between them, and we call that stimulus discrimination. Okay, Harry's probably a little bit older, has more complex schemas out there. He knows the difference between turkey and chicken and live chicken and dead chicken. Okay. Now, Harry's condition response disappeared. And his nausea when seeing chicken disappeared after he forced himself to eat chicken and kind of get over this. But a few years later, he walks by a Popeye's and gets nauseous. Why? How did that happen? Well, first we know that his behavior of nausea when seeing chicken was extinguished, right? It was extinct. And all of a sudden, it came back, which is called spontaneous recovery, which can happen. Often conditioning is a whole different ballgame here, but we are still talking about stimulus and response, but not in the same order that you see here with classical conditioning. Instead, with operant conditioning is that we have a response, which is a voluntary, not an involuntary, a voluntary behavior, like making your bed, okay, doing your homework. And then you have a stimulus, which we know better as a consequence for that behavior. And of course, the response has to come before the stimulus. Why? Well, you would never reinforce or punish a voluntary behavior before it occurred, unless, of course, there's that movie, I think, Minority Report, which does that, where they think they know what you're going to do next, and they punish it. Okay. So um, where did this all come from? Well, B.F. Skinner, he coined the term operant conditioning. And he had a Skinner box and he put animals in there and he sort of looked at what they would do and what kind of rewards and punishments would, what would happen to their behaviors. Now Thorndike, E.L. Thorndike came up with something really magical called the law of effect. And I'm being a little sarcastic here because what he says is that behaviors followed by desirable consequences are repeated and behaviors followed by undesirable consequences are extinguished. I don't know, it seemed a little bit obvious to me, but it is a law of effect and it's a really important concept in operant conditioning. I wanna draw this in. I think Dr. Soap talked about this. We are trying to move a lot of what we do in our clinical psychology unit throughout the other units. I wanna talk about a specific disorder. It's a somatic or specific set of disorders, somatic symptom disorders. When I talk about somatic symptom disorders, it includes somatic symptom disorder, illness, anxiety, conversion, factitious malingering. All of these disorders are when an individual focuses on physical symptoms, which typically are either present or barely present, but their focus on it is disproportionate to the severity of the symptoms. Okay? Now, people that are diagnosed with these, these disorders will often spend a lot of time invested in seeking medical attention for these non-serious physical symptoms. And their behaviors are reinforced okay, by the attention that they receive from their family and their physicians. And the belief is the psychic pain that they have, um, they don't believe that they'll get the, the help for it, so they kind of manifest it as physical pain. So a little bit of connection there between those two. Okay, operant conditioning, reinforcements and punishments. When would you want to reinforce a behavior? Well, only when you want it to continue. When would you want to punish behavior? Only when you want it to stop. And we talk about positive and negative. They don't necessarily mean good or bad. Okay? They mean adding something or removing something. So positive reinforcement is when something desirable is added. So think about what you are positively reinforced for. Okay? Many people do their homework because they get a positive reinforcement of a good grade. Okay? But other people do their homework to avoid a punishment, to avoid a, fail a failing grade. That's called negative reinforcement. So basically, anytime you behave in a way where you're trying to avoid a punishment, your behavior is being negatively reinforced. Okay? 
this is a hard one for people to understand, but it's the removal, okay, of a potentially, a potential bad thing and a potential aversive stimulus. Your behavior avoids that, that aversive stimulus or removes it if it's happening to you right now. So if somebody's hitting you and they say, say uncle, say uncle, say uncle, you say uncle, that behavior saying uncle is negatively reinforced because now that person stops bothering you. Now with punishment, and we talk about positive punishment, we're talking about adding something undesirable, okay? Like a thinking, and that's called aversive conditioning. And if we talk about negative punishment, we're talking about removing something that is desirable, like removing your cell phone. Okay, when you do something your parents don't like. Punishment, it should be immediate. It should be consistent. It should be inescapable. We know that it's really important for that punishments to actually work and to affect a, a change in behavior. So here's the thing. I had uh, two sisters and um, we used to, you know, well, we didn't, uh, I did, used to borrow their clothes uh, without asking. And they'd yell at me and scream at me and I would continue to do it. Now, if they knew anything about operant conditioning, they should have realized that their yelling at me was not a punishment because I would have stopped if it was a punishment. I kept doing it. So basically their yelling was a reinforcement for me, okay? So they were positively reinforcing, reinforcing me by yelling at me. I thought it was kind of funny to be honest with you. Okay, let's take a look at an example here. So what I wanna take a look at is four different examples and they're gonna fit into one of these four categories, okay? And I want you to remember, I want you to identify the behavior and the consequence in each scenario. Remember, the behavior comes before the consequence. So Ciara is grounded when she is caught skipping school. Okay? Behavior comes before the consequence. What's the behavior here? She got caught skipping school. What came after that is the consequence, the grounding. Do we want that behavior to stop or to continue? And if the answer is to stop, we know it's a punishment. So if it's a punishment, was something um, unpleasant added or was something pleasant removed? In the case of CR, something pleasant was removed. She was grounded, just like a timeout. You're taking away somebody's freedom, okay? So grounding and timeouts are considered negative punishments. Sammy takes an aspirin when she has a headache and it goes away, okay? So what was the behavior? What came first? Take the aspirin. Consequence? Headache goes away. Would she do it again? Probably. That means that this is a reinforced behavior. Was something pleasant added or was something unpleasant removed? Something unpleasant, the headache was removed. This is an example of negative reinforcement. Okay. Eli's mother yells at him when he messes up his room. What came first? Okay. What came first is he messed up his room and then his mother yelled at him. Uh, potentially, we're assuming that she wants him to stop messing up his room. So it's a punishment. Did she add something unpleasant or did she remove something pleasant? And she added something unpleasant, yelling at him, like okay, that's, that's a punishment and a positive punishment, which leaves our last one with Leonard who does chores. His parents give him one extra hour on the Xbox. Most people can identify positive reinforcement. I want to take a look at operant conditioning and an FRQ tip. When responding to an FRQ using any of those four terms, please to, uh, make sure that you specifically state whether or not the behavior will continue if the term is reinforcement or that it will stop if it's a punishment. So let me give you an example. Yolanda's parents gave her $50 to uh, let her drive the family car to the grocery store to shop for food for the week. Explain how the following concepts would influence Yolanda's trip to the store. And I'm just going to do positive reinforcement. Now, this first example does not score. And I want you to think about why. Think about my tip and then think about why. Positive reinforcement is when a behavior is followed by the presentation of a desirable stimulus, a reward. Yolanda stops and fills her family cars up with gas on this trip. And her parents let her use that car that weekend to drive her friends to a movie. Now, I know that sounds like positive reinforcement, but it doesn't score. Why not? No indication that Yolanda's behavior will continue and you would need to do that, okay? So a better response, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, is that Yolanda will continue to fill the car up with gas whenever she runs errands because of the promise of the desirable stimulus, the reward of being able to use the car to drive her friends to outings, okay? Make sure you indicate it will continue.
We're going to move on to reinforcement schedules because what Skinner did find in the Skinner box is that there are uh, ways in which you could uh, train an organism and reinforce them and get their behavior to be very quickly acquired. And then other ways you could train them to make sure that that behavior was resistant to extinction. So it didn't go away when the reinforcement wasn't available. So there's, I know, a lot of words on this page here, but let's think about what this means. Fixed ratio, fixed interval. Variable ratio, variable, variable interval. When I say fixed, I'm saying some predictable thing has happened. For example, in a fixed ratio, a predictable number of responses, like my son eats his broccoli three times, and then what? He gets a cupcake, okay? Whereas a fixed interval would be a passage of time. My son practices the clarinet for 15 minutes. I give him a cupcake. It's predictable. One is the instance of a behavior, eating broccoli. One is the passage of time, playing the piano or playing a musical instrument or with clarinet. Now with variable, it's unpredictable. We, we've also called this a partial schedule of reinforcement. Reinforcement comes after an unpredictable number of responses. Um, so maybe what I do is he eats broccoli two days, I give him a cupcake. Then, for, then the next four times he gets broccoli, he gets a cupcake. Then the next eight times he eats his broccoli, he gets a cupcake. On average, I'm probably giving him a cupcake on average every six times he eats his broccoli. Variable. Okay. With variable interval, it'd be the same thing. It could be practicing that clarinet. Sometimes I come in after 10 minutes and give him a cupcake. Sometimes I give him, come in after 30 minutes and give him a cupcake. So if you are going to train, and you probably know this if you've ever trained a dog, if you want to train your dog and you want it to happen quickly, you probably want to use this one-to-one -one fixed ratio. It's called a continuous ratio. Sit, treat, sit, treat, sit, treat, right? You don't have to keep giving your dog a treat. So you want to move to a variable ratio of reinforcement. This, this partial schedule of reinforcement, it makes the behavior more resistant to extinction. Sit, treat. And then maybe he sits 10 times before you actually give another treat. And then maybe it's three times and you give him a treat. Never knows when the treat's coming. He's going to sit when, he, when you say sit. So we're going to practice this by looking at, again, some different scenarios. Uh, we're going to take a look at four scenarios, and I want you to ask yourself, is the reinforcement fixed or variable? In other words, is it predictable or unpredictable? In the first scenario, I want to reinforce my students for being on task in, in Zoom. So every 10 minutes, I visit the breakout room to see how they're doing, fixed or variable. It's fixed every 10. Ms. Penson rewards her piano students with a treatment, sometimes after they learn two pieces, sometimes after they learn three pieces. Is that fixed or variable? And it appears to be variable. Mr. Williams, a soccer coach, will give his players a water break on average every 15 minutes. On average. Do they know when it's coming? No, it's unpredictable. It's variable. And then Dr. Swope, he encourages his students to complete unit reading guides by giving them completion points for each guide turned in on time. They know if they turn in a guide, they're going to get completion points. This is fixed, it's predictable. But the second question we have to ask is if the reinforcement is based on, on a ratio, in other words, the number of times the person's engaging in a behavior or passage of time. So every 10 minutes I visit a breakout room to see how they're doing. Is it based upon, I don't know, the number of times I come in? No, it's based upon the number of minutes that have passed. So this would be an example of interval. So this here would be a fixed interval schedule of reinforcement. Ms. Henson rewards her piano students with a treat sometimes after they learn two pieces, sometimes after they learn three pieces. Now, I don't know, maybe some took me about uh, two years to learn two pieces on the piano, and for some people it might take them three days. Okay? So this was clearly nothing to do with time. This is a ratio. Mr. Williams will give players a water break on average after they've been out on the field about every 15 minutes. So we are again talking about passage of time, right, an interval. And then there's Dr. Swope giving out those points, completion points for reading guides. Every reading guide, every instance of doing a reading guide, you get a reinforcement. It's, it's definitely a ratio. So when we look at these, we have a fixed interval, a variable ratio, a variable interval, and a fixed ratio. So we have all four represented here by asking ourselves those questions.
Here's a practice. Jenna's dog comes sniffing at the table whenever they eat. Sometimes Jenna pushes her dog away and other times she feeds the dog. What is the operant conditioning principle that maintains the dog's behavior of begging for food? Maintains it. The behavior is continuing. It has to be reinforcement. So the question is, what schedule is she using? The dog keeps coming back and forth and back and forth. It's got to be a variable and it looks to be instant. So we're looking here a variable ratio schedule of reinforcement. She's clearly not punishing her dog. She had punished her dog, he wouldn't come back begging for food. Clyde misses a game-winning opportunity on the soccer field and his teammates all walk up the field without saying a word for, to him. This is an example of what? Well, first of all, do you think they want Clyde to continue missing that game-winning opportunity? No, so it's clearly a punishment. Did they add something pleasant? I'm sorry, did they add something unpleasant or did they take away something pleasant? And I would argue they took away something pleasant. Anytime you give somebody the silent treatment, you're taking away the pleasant interaction that they would have with you. So we would consider that to be negative punishment. And here we have Lester. He has a thumb sucking problem that was causing social and dental problems. And working with the therapist, Lester's parents put a plan in place where he would receive a reward whenever they rang a bell and his thumb was not in his mouth. The bell was rung at random times throughout the day. The therapist was hoping to extinguish Lester's behavior by using what? Think about it. Now, I think you're probably looking for a variable interval and it's not there because, you yeah, they, they know, they're using, uh, they, he never knows when it's coming, so it's variable and it's based on passage of time and unpredictable passage of time. But what we have here is a partial reinforcement schedule. So in the answer, there's no specific answer that you might be looking for, but it still fits that this is a partial reinforcement schedule. We're going to find the shaping and chaining, and sometimes we want to get somebody to engage in a behavior that for a young child, for example, is very complicated. So we use something called shaping, and what we do is we, we reinforce successive approximations of the desired behavior. And I'm using putting away your toys. I want you to put away your toys. So we're going to start with rewarding. I'm just using a star my child for putting away the first toy. And then the next day, I'm not gonna reinforce him until he puts away two toys. And then on the third day, I'm not reinforcing him until he puts away all of the toys, okay? And so now the child knows the reinforcement is only available after all the toys are put away. But I gave him little pieces of reward so he could learn the behavior. But what if the behavior is a little more complex, like it's an after-school routine, and there's lots of shaped behaviors in an after-school routine, right? You gotta put away your toys, hang up your clothes, make your bed, although I prefer to make my bed in the morning, but I'll let my kids make it in the afternoon, get your homework out, okay? So now I'm chaining together a number of shaped behaviors. So on the first day, I will reinforce with a star when the first thing is done, which is put away toys. On the second day, I don't give that star out till two things are done. And then the third one, making the bed, and finally the star doesn't come until the entire sequence in the chain is completed. But still, you're giving the child reinforcement along the way, and, and you are chaining together a number of shaped behaviors. Here's an interesting concept. It's called the overjustification effect. You all remember what intrinsic motivation is? That's like when you feel good about something and you do it for you, okay? It makes you feel good. Well, take somebody who might have intrinsic motivation for reading a book, okay? Now their teacher comes along and says, you know, I'm gonna give you stars. I keep using stars, but stickers, whatever it could be, for reading a book. And these extrinsic rewards are offered to this child. Well, we find out that intrinsic motivation, the motivation they had to read the book declines. And how do we know that? Well, when extrinsic rewards are removed, the behavior becomes extinguished. So what we have again, an intrinsic mo motivated person to read a book. Extrinsic rewards are present, prevented, uh, presented, 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 intrinsic goes away. And we're really left with needing that extrinsic reward in order to engage in that behavior. And that's called the overjustification effect. I had one son, I had to give him a reinforcement for doing homework. And the other one, if I had done that, I would have replaced his intrinsic motivation. He just came home and he just liked to get that stuff out of the way. Okay. Now, there are a lot of common terms with associative, with associative learning, with this, this conditioning we're talking about. Uh, acquisition is a term we use for both classical and operant conditioning. So you, you acquire perhaps a hunger response at 1130 every day because you've been conditioned through time, temporal conditioning, to get hungry at 1130 because that's when you have to eat lunch at school, right? And that hunger 
is an autonomic, right? It's an involuntary uh, behavior, that hunger. Our parent conditioning is different. It's voluntary, right? So you come home and you do your homework because you associate it with your parents nagging you if you don't do it. So you're negatively reinforced to do your homework. Do your homework to avoid the nagging. That's a voluntary behavior, but it's still acquisition. When we talk about extinction and spontaneous recovery, think about uh, waves. Some people get really afraid like when they see ocean waves. But if you spend some time in them, you might become extinguished with that fear is extinguished because you realize it's not so bad. After all, it's kind of fun. But then a couple of years later, you haven't been to the beach in a while. You go back and you start to feel that kind of anxious feeling in your stomach, spontaneous recovery. Now that's classical, right? Because that and feeling of fear is, a, is definitely a classically, I'm sorry, is a unconditioned uh, behavior. Okay, it's unlearned. Operant conditioning is different. Let's say your parents gave you an allowance to do when you were younger to do chores, and then they stopped giving you the allowance and you stopped doing the chores. Extinction, voluntary behavior. Now you go away to college and you find you come home and you empty out the dishwasher without anybody asking you, in my dreams, yes, but that would be considered spontaneous recovery. Stimulus generalization, we've kind of covered that a little bit. I have some other examples in here. Let's say you're expecting a call from an admissions counselor. So every time your phone rings, you jump nervously because you're associating the ringing of their phone with like having to talk to an admission counselor at college. And then you find yourself jumping when the oven timer goes off. Stimulus generalization, okay? So let's say you make your bed at home and then you go to college and you find that you make your that in college, it would be great if we could get those habits in you. Um, that would be also stimulus generalization. There's no reinforcement available at college for you to make your bed. No one's going to get mad at you or get angry at you. And if you do it anyway, you've generalized that stimulus. Okay? Stimulus discrimination. If you ever go out for a run and you see a cougar, you might get scared. But you see a cat, and you're probably not too scared because you can discriminate between those two stimuli. And with operant conditioning, remember, scared or fear is a um, what we talk about is that autonomic response right you, it's not something you control it's instinctual innate with operant conditioning let's say we know that you don't pack up and leave class when you hear the fire alarm but you do pack up and hear class when you, the end of the period bell rings because you can distinguish between the two stimulus discrimination so I want you to think about how, how you might have had an adult in your life reinforce desirable behaviors okay what schedule and reinforcement did they use? And what will happen to your behavior once the reinforcement is no longer available? Now, for me, an adult in my life was my AP Spanish teacher. He always gave us happy faces when our homework was legible. And he used a continuous ratio because it was every time. But to be honest with you, I don't really stress over handwriting anymore. And I certainly didn't when I left high school. So I would say he was using a continuous ratio that was, you know, it was extinguished almost immediately. So if you want to go ahead and share your experiences, go ahead and join nearpod.com. It's the same code that I gave you earlier, P-E-K-N-5, or you can use your phone and you can scan the QR code and go ahead and either now or later enter in what you think uh, about this. Is there an adult who's reinforced some desirable behaviors that you have had? Okay, and take a look at that and think about that for a minute. I'm going to move on. I'll give you a chance though, to scan that code in to get to Nearpod. Okay. Well, learning without consequences. And observational learning was one of the terms I used in the stump me. So the question is, do we always need to be directly punished or reinforced to learn and then exhibit behavior, right? Do you actually have to you know, get, get suspended from school to realize you shouldn't you know, come to campus with um, you know, something that is not permitted on campus? We know, we know what those are. Okay. No, probably not. So Bobo Dahl's experiment, remember Bandura? He found that children who witnessed uh, somebody being violent towards the Bobo Dahl, being aggressive towards the Bobo Dahl, themselves came up with some novel aggressive behavior towards that Bobo Dahl. But he also talked about modeling. He talked about the four things that we needed in order to model that behavior. You need to pay attention to the model. You need to be able to remember what the model did, be able to physically reproduce it, and you have to be motivated to produce it. And mirror neurons, of course, when we see somebody do some, doing something, that's something I can relate to when we talk about observational learning. So I have this story, and I know you might not find this as funny as I can now look at it and find it funny. I didn't before. I let my kids play GTA when they were about seven, but I honestly did not know what it was, that we were at 
GameStop. They said, hey, mom, can I buy GTA? I'm like, oh, whatever, Xbox game. Okay, sure. Bought it for them, got it home. Two weeks later, I go downstairs and I see them doing some things I didn't want them to be doing on a video game. Um, but here's, I took it away. <laughs> but the truth was that they never went out and stole cars because they couldn't physically reproduce, right? The, what they saw on the video. And they actually weren't motivated to steal cars. I think they were a little more interested in other things at that point. Learned helplessness. What happens when desirable behaviors are punished? We know that in the Seligman study with dogs that were um, constantly shocked and not allowed to escape, that they learned that they couldn't escape and stopped trying. So even when they could escape, they didn't try. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I like to think of it as like child abuse victims. If you think about it, they say, I tried to escape. I can't escape. I give up trying. And that's not self-fulfilling prophecy because if you give up trying at anything, you're never going to be able to do it. Okay. Learned helplessness. So we're going to practice. Which of the following provides an effective explanation for the data? Uh, what we see here is exposure to media violence. And it looks like with elementary school girls and boys, it goes as exposure goes up, so does aggressive behavior. Okay, this is clearly an example of being able to read a chart, but also of observational learning. Okay. Learned helplessness is most likely to result when, what is in place here? Take a look at these. A reinforcement occurs on an intermittent schedule. An organism receives negative reinforcement. A response is reinforced independently. Responses have no effect on the environment or young organisms fail to imprint. And the answer is responses have no effect on the environment. So you try something and it has no effect, you're gonna give up. Self, uh, it's like kind of uh, um, expectancy value theory, which we'll talk about. Okay, so we talk about behaviorism applied to treatment. Behavioral therapy is supposed to change our unhealthy behaviors because behaviors believe we learn everything. We learn unhealthy behaviors, we can unlearn uh, unhealthy behaviors, okay? So let's take a look at anxiety disorders and, uh, and exposure therapies and then behavior modification techniques. Remembering that what a disorder is, is deviant, meaning not typical, distressful to oneself or others, and dysfunctional, impairing your ability to live your daily life. So if we look at phobias, like agoraphobia, like a, a being fearful of being in like a, a space where you cannot escape, Okay, you might use something called systematic desensitization, where you establish a anxiety hierarchy. So you say the lowest level of the hierarchy is when I open the door, ugh, I get anxious. When I step outside, I get even more anxious. I drive to the market, I get really anxious. Being in the market, super anxious. Then you train the client on these relaxation techniques, and then you eventually expose them like, like deep breathing, meditation, and then you expose them back to this hierarchy at the low level, right? And they breathe deeply through each level of this hierarchy until they go get through their phobias or their fears. Now, when we talk about other types of exposure therapies, it could be flooding. In other words, uh, you would tell the patient, like, here's how you can relax yourself, deep breathing, meditation, and then you expose them to the worst stimulus possible. So if they're afraid of snakes, you put them in a pit of snakes. Don't do that. But, uh, but yeah, that is what flooding might be. It's also called implosion therapy. Okay, spectrum disorder might have certain behaviors that we would like to change. And one of those ways in which we do that is through something called token economy. So with autism spectrum, sometimes children don't look people in the eye when they speak to them. So you might give them a dot on the hand and every time, once they have like a bunch of dots, like five dots on their hand, they can exchange these tokens, these secondary reinforcers that aren't really valuable in and of themselves with primary reinforcers, something that is valuable, like an hour of free playtime. Okay? So token economies can be used to sort of exchange later for rewards. And we might use that with things like autism spectrum disorder. Addictions can be uh, treated with aversive therapy. Alcohol addictions, people who are addicted to alcohol might be given a drug so if they drink alcohol, they get nauseous. Gambling addiction, force a client to burn a dollar for every dollar gambled. Okay, those are both aversive conditioning. Okay, you're presenting an aversive stimulus and hoping to change that behavior. It's a punishment. Okay, uh, which of the following statements about behavior therapy is true? Take a look. Remembering behavioral therapy is all about manipulating the external environment 
and the physiological internal environment, right? It's all about environment. Okay, so this is going to be your FRQ for uh, next week. I'll let you go ahead and get a chance to maybe take a picture of that so you can go through that with Dr. Swope on Monday. And again, don't forget to provide feedback and or stump the teacher using that QR code here. That's important. And go ahead and please do that. We really do want to hear you and we'll try to answer some of the questions you have each day. And I want to thank you. Thank you for going through operating classical conditioning with me. Uh, thank you for spending your time reviewing and I hope you have a great weekend.